What's good, everybody? Welcome to another Niners Nation podcast. I'm Rob Stats Guerrera. Very excited today. Got an interesting guest, somebody that I know back from my days at ESPN Radio way back in, God, the early 2000s now. Mike Golick Jr., you know him from Cheney and Golick. You know him from pretty much everything ESPN. What's up, Mike? Thanks for coming out. Stats. I was going to say, we were just talking about the entire like Mike and Mike coaching tree and where everyone's ended up right now. So glad we can link back up, man. It's been a while. <laughs> yes, it definitely has. Um, there's a ton I want to get to, but I always said that if I got the chance to interview you, uh, I would do this because I used to produce pro football talk, which was on 6 a.m. So I would be driving into work when you were on with Robin Lundberg on the overnights on ESPN radio with first and last. And I got to tell you, when I first heard you were on the air, I was like, this is bullshit. Golik's kid is on the air. He doesn't deserve this. This is unbelievable. And I thought you stunk. And I listened to you every single day. And I want to say to you, I was jealous. And I was 100% wrong then. And you've only gotten better now. And I wanted to say it on the air because I always felt bad about it. I know Dyrus, I always said I would never begrudge anyone for feeling that way about me because listen, we all certainly get jobs for different reasons. And I knew a big part of mine was exactly what everyone saw there. So I didn't begrudge anyone for feeling that way. And you were probably right then because God <laughs> love Robin Lundberg, who had to really help me along on all that one. I have I know everyone tells you to save your first couple of shows and go back and listen. I have not had the courage to go back and listen to those first couple of first and last. So you were probably right then, but man, it, uh, it, it's, it's been a journey for sure. I got lucky that they put me there and just, you know, tried to make the most of it since it's just like football, it just reps, reps, reps. And uh, you know, thankfully the badge still works at this point. So we'll see how much longer we can fool them. So I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong, clearly, but I don't think I'm wrong when I look at the 49ers offensive line. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, I don't know where to start. I got to start, I guess, with Mike McGlinchey. Like, can you explain to me how a dude that was picked in the <laughs> top 10 of the draft is getting put on his ass by defensive backs last season? So I, I think Mike and for, I think last season is going to end up being a bit of an anomaly for Mike here. I, I just, I know for him, he was a guy that when I first met him, he was a you know tight end basketball player that we were converting to an offensive line in college. And so his steady growth, like both literal, you know, figuratively and literally has been something where he's just been stacking constantly on the foundation. And that's why when I saw him at nine and a lot of people questioned the pick, I was like, this is, going to be about long-term growth because again when you look at the skills that Mike brings to the table it's exactly what's supposed to work in these Shanahan offenses right big incredibly mobile guys who can get out there and move on the edge he's got an unbelievable mate and Trent Williams on the other side of this situation to continue to I think add skills to the toolbox right like Mike's got great pedigree was coached by one of the best O-line coaches in the world and Harry Heastan when he was at Notre Dame and so I think it's just one of those things that if you get a year where, you know, you start to lose that confidence early, because for me, it was, you know, the micro within a body of a game, I need to go out there the first series, get a couple of good plays, good blocks under my belt to feel better about things. For Mike, I, I just think it was one of those situations last year where, like a lot of the season for the Niners, it was hampered by injury early on. Things got a little bit out of control and untenable sooner in the season than everyone expected. And sometimes those things could snowball. So I, I know what Mike's about. I know his makeup and the work habits for him. And, and just between that and the things technically that I know are in his DNA, I'd be willing to say that there's a much better year ahead of him than there was behind. He did kind of say that the – COVID protocols and sort of the isolation, especially once the Niners got kicked out of California and had to go to Arizona, that that kind of got to him a little bit, that he, with the, between the criticism online and the isolation, he kind of went to a dark place. Yeah, which is understandable, especially given the nature of that position, right? Because that's the one thing about the offensive line is you're, you're used to almost always being together, doing things together. And, I, I, you know, I firmly believe that whether it's off the field, whether it's the way that you watch film together and not being able to do that as much, all those little moments where you can steal time with the guys you're going to work with pay dividends on the field. And so, yeah, listen, it was a year last year that was mentally trying for a lot of us. And so I believe Mike, when he says that 
maybe all of those things impact us a little bit more in a year where the rest of our life is so out of balance. So, you know, uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, that probably being at the forefront for everyone here, I'm willing to extend a little bit of grace that way and say this guy's probably coming back with a vengeance this year. Well, I hope so, because I couldn't understand how he could be so good at run blocking and strong enough in run blocking to shove people around, which he absolutely did. He's one of the best run blockers in the entire league. But then when it came to pass blocking, it looked like all that strength just disappeared. Yeah, well, and that's one of those things, too, that when, again, when Mike came in, he was a guy that had to add a lot of lower body strength there. And so you got to think his foundation was a spot where he was, you know, at the beginning of his time at Notre Dame, having to compensate for that, being a taller dude who wasn't as thick in the lower body yet. And so, you know, he's he's really like, you know, from his last year at Notre Dame to now gotten into that man body. I mean, I saw him this offseason for a little bit. Uh, let me tell you, Niners fans, he looks ready. He looks very, <laughs> very ready. So I, I just think for him, it's always like, you know, a, him his physical makeup has been getting to a spot where he's comfortable with all the lower body strength that he has now and compare that with the rest of those natural gifts that he's got to be a you know cleaner pass protector in a number of those spots. Because I know it's been at times power that's gotten him in trouble. And then from there, once you do that, that's when everything else can come into play there. But if a defensive end's got a base of knowing I can bother you with power, the rest of the house of cards falls down. So uh, I, again, just know, knowing Mike and knowing what he's got in him, I'm feeling pretty good about this. See, you're that's music to a lot of Niner fans' ears because he's one of the he was like the target last season when anything would go wrong. It was pick on Mike McGlinchey day. And a lot of people have hit me up and they say that he's gonna play better this year because he's gonna have somebody new next to him, probably going to be Aaron Banks, who they took in the second round. Um, first question is how much does the guard next to you influence you as a tackle? Oh, it's huge. I'll never forget. So I did two off seasons with the New Orleans Saints. And that was when Jari Evans was the right guard and mm -hmm. Zach Streep was the right tackle. And they had been together like nine something years at that spot. And it was crazy. Every, you know, we've every O line's got their different calls and the way I, they identify different situations. And you've got a call for every possible look and for every possible situation. And we would watch Zach and Ja, whether it was on the field or in the film room. And there was no need for them to communicate. Like our coach had to tell us, you guys have to use the words because when you just hear Zach go, ja, 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 and ja go, I know. <laughs> Those guys have seen so much football together the same possible way. They've watched so much of it together and worked through so many of those situations that based on that relationship, they've eliminated so much of the communication that can slow you down up front in that spot. And so seeing that kind of time under task and the way that one helps the other there, because you've got to constantly be in sync with the guard next to you, with the tight end next to you, if you've got that guy in line. Because if one of if you guys are seeing the same thing, but not executing, you can correct that. But if you can't get to the spot where you guys are seeing the picture the same way, that to me is the hardest thing. And that's why the relationship is so important. So if you've got a guy next to you that you trust enough to work through those things, or you already know and have a relationship with, I think all those little things matter because if you can cut down on some of that time getting to know each other, that's a huge win for all those reasons. And now he's got Aaron Banks coming in, which kind of surprised me a little because Banks is a huge dude, 6'5", 325, not necessarily the kind of guard that I thought Kyle Shanahan would go with. Um, is he going to be able to kind of get out there on the run and, and, you know, block things up, especially in the running game, the way Shanahan likes to do? Yeah, I think that's the one thing I, I've been trying to tell people about Banksy because, you know, for him, he was a guy that got on the field when he got entered into the lineup. It was Navy game against Notre Dame in 2018. It was like the last thing that group needed to really get back to being an elite line. And at first it was just the physical presence. It was this guy is an absolute definition of a dancing bear. But the one thing about playing O-line at Notre Dame is it's an incredibly scheme versatile system. So you're not going to go there and just run like a bunch of gap double stuff like you would. Like most people would look at Aaron Banks and say, that's a Steelers offensive line. Yes. We're going to go and get a bunch of big double teams in there. But Banks played in a system that does a ton of outside zone, that has a ton of pin and pull stuff in there, that gets the quarterback on the move, that uses that stretch zone. So 
He's blocked up a lot of different schemes and blocked them well. He was a guy that was so fun to watch because, again, all the ability in the world when he got on the field in 18. And the two years after that have been him refining technique in a way that's become very emblematic of that program. And so for him, I think you get a guy coming out. I've said for all the Notre Dame guys, clean prospects. Like these are guys that know what they're supposed to do. They've got a lot of tools in the bag already. And for Banksy, one of those has been, he's been in a scheme and a a run system, especially at Notre Dame with Tommy Reese there that asks you to do a lot of different things. One of which is, you know, a part of which is a lot of the same stuff you'll see in Kyle's offense. That is a pretty good answer. I had not, I did not know that. So that's good news too. Like you're just full of good news today, Mike. That's awesome. Um, Continuing as we work our way through the line, Alex Mack is going to be the center. Kyle Shanahan's, I think, favorite offensive lineman of all time. I know he's older, you know, he's not the Alex Mack he was in Atlanta, but considering how important center is in the Shanahan system, I feel like this is the under the radar upgrade for the Niners that could make a huge difference. It's uh, uh, Alex has been one of my favorite players to watch since he's been in the league. Like this is, this is like one of your favorite offensive linemen's favorite offensive linemen, just because (laughs) he's a teach tape guy. Like I I think of him uh, in a lot of ways, very similarly to how I would picture like Eric Wood when he was in Buffalo, when you cut on the tape, like it all looks like it's supposed to when you teach it. The difference is, is both of those guys are just such incredible athletes and strong enough to go execute it. And so combine that with the knowledge of the offense here, because whatever's going to happen at quarterback, whether it's going to be Jimmy or whether they're going to, you know, obviously trot the nice shiny new draft pick out at quarterback in that spot as well with Trey, like having his presence under center is so common and center is a spot too, where I know, you know, in an outside zone based scheme, you're going to have to be out there on the move, but you're also protected in spots. So even as you get up there and age a little bit, I mean, we saw this to an extent with, you know, similar system as far as how you're going to operate and window dress things out in Los Angeles with the Rams. John Sullivan was an older guy in the league when he was playing out there for McVay, but he was the linchpin in the middle of that line for a long time. And Alex has been a markedly better player than Sully was who I, you know, who I love is a great guy, but you know, Alex Max has been one of the best centers in the league for, you know, the better part of a decade. So I, I, I think it's incredible. And I think he's such a steadying force in there. How are you protected as a center in that system? Well, I mean, you've got to think, you know, if you're constantly in the middle of outside zones now, you can ask some different stuff of him in the run game based on how much gas is still left in the tank here, you know, what you can do against certain looks. But I think overall in schemes that are outside zone heavy, in schemes that are play action pass heavy, like you got guards on either side of you there. Like I spent a lot of time playing between center and guard and you're ISOed up a lot less, even in this day and age where some teams, especially in this division, will kick it down, will put a guy over your face and try and mess with you there. He's just been he's been so capable in all those areas that now you've got those buffers on either side of you, especially when the basis of the system is, hey, we're going to make it look the same every single time, try and jam you up in there. You've always got a little added cushion on either side. And you mentioned your favorite offensive lineman's favorite offensive lineman. I mean, Trent Williams at left tackle – He's a unicorn. Like, how is this guy this big, this strong, this fast? I saw a play today where he was running stride for stride with Pierre Garçon down the field at one point. Yeah, listen, some people just leave the hospital with more. Like, Trent, <laughs> Trent, Trent's one of those guys where he just get, he can show up out there and his job is to block. Like, I had a buddy of mine one time who played in the league for probably five or six years. He was an undrafted free agent when he started. And he said at some point, he's like, when you're looking at a lot of these protections, it's like, all right, as we're figuring out how we're going to go about addressing someone's pass rush for that week or how they want to dial things up, it's, hey, we got a tackle that's making 15 to $17 million out there. Guess who's got to win his one-on-one battle so the rest of us can get help? We Trent, you don't got to think about that. Like, you put him against the best pass rusher on every team, and you can call that a wash. Like, there, you don't have to worry about that anymore. And it just – mentally what it does for the rest of an offensive line to know all right we got a guy that's better than anyone they can throw at us so lock him down out there now we can give help to the guys that need it on any given time now we can try and allocate the resources to the place that we need so for Trent to just be able to walk out there and whoop everyone's you know what on command is one of the more fun things in football to watch 
the story that I love is that basically not last year, but the year before Bosa was owning everybody in training camp. Like he was kicking everybody's ass and then he would go up against Trent Williams and people were like, he made Bosa look like a small child out there. Like he just totally shut him down. There's nothing cooler too. Cause one-on-ones are a drill scheme for the, for the defensive line. Like, there's no time in a game where you're going to have a pass rush that's going to set up that perfect for you where everyone in the stadium knows it here. But that's, I mean, so I played with Zach Martin at Notre Dame. We used to yep. call him the warden because he would just promptly escort people past the quarterback and we'd do one-on-ones <laughs> and they'd throw NFL talent got at him all day and it just didn't matter. And like for Trent to be doing that against a guy and Nick, who, I mean, God came into this league a more complete D lineman than most guys you'll see after six or seven years. It's, it's just a reminder. Again, some people's better is just better than everyone else's. And Trent Williams is one of those dudes. I know I skipped Lake and Tomlinson at left guard. There's, I have nothing bad to say about Lake and Tomlinson. He stays healthy. He does a fine job. Um, but you mentioned the quarterback. I don't know if you know this, when you do an interview about the 49ers, you have to mention Trey Lance. Like it's in our contract somewhere. The thing I wanted to get to with you is your reaction when Lance was picked <laughs> just stuck with me because you were like, you were pumped. And 99% of Niner fans were pissed because they wanted Justin Fields. And Trey Lance was the pick and you were excited. Why were you so pumped up when he got picked? Uh, to be clear, at that point, I had said, if I'm taking a quarterback in this draft at that point was going to be the third off the board, I had gone for Justin Fields too. But I had heard so much reporting leading up to them. We had all heard about the supposed love affair that we had with Kyle and Mac Jones. And that was just one of those spots where, again, it's, it's no slight. Mac got picked exactly where I thought Mac should have gotten picked. Middle of the first round, like, he was absolutely that talented at Alabama. There's a reason the Crimson Tide picked him to play quarterback. Like, they don't pick slouches in this day and age for Nick Saban and them there. But just looking at the rest of it, it's like, all right, I, I needed to feel like I still knew what I was talking about looking at football. And so if it wasn't going to be Justin Fields, I said, you know what, at least with Trey Lance here, you can trust a lot of the similarities and what he did and what they did offensively with personnel and concepts when he was at North Dakota State, the otherworldly physical gifts. By all accounts, if you talk to the people that either got a chance to interview him during the pre-draft process or been around him, the guy sounds like an absolute football savant, like the kind of guy that Kyle Shanahan would love to be in a quarterback room with. And so it was just me selfishly like confirming that I wasn't crazy <laughs> and hadn't forgotten everything that I'd known about football. When I heard you talk about him, you mentioned that he's under center, that he runs a lot of play action. You just mentioned, mentioned the mental side of things. I hear all that. And then, so how am I hearing people say that he needs time? Like, aren't all those the things that would determine whether or not you were ready to play in the league? And he only played one game last year. So you're going to sit him this year. So then he hasn't played football in like two years. Like to me, you got to get him out there and you got to get him out there as soon as possible. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And I, I will steal this from Dan Orlovsky, our great NFL analyst over at ESPN, where it's just right for all of those reasons for how young he is. He needs reps. Like you need to get him out there and get him in as many game scenarios as you can right now. Cause the team overall, there's a lot of good young talent and key spots on this team. It's a one we expect to win now, obviously like that's you know what you're expected with Kyle as your head coach with where they were a couple of years ago in the Super Bowl. All that being said, you drafted him with the idea that he was going to be your franchise for the next 15 years. And so you got to get that party started. Now, unless you see something glaring in camp, Jimmy Garoppolo has done a lot of really good things for this 49ers team, but comparing the ceilings just isn't even close. And so it's time to wave by to that and say, you know what, Jimmy's going to be a great force in that room. By all accounts, too, I'll give him credit. Handled this as well as anyone can be asked to in that situation. Is said and done all the right things that you'd expect a player to do in that spot. And, you know, I, I think they should give him the chance to do that and let Trey be the one that plays the football. I don't like that Jimmy's there, Mike. I don't, you can't have the new girlfriend move in when the old girlfriend is still living there. And you know how it's going to be in practice. The offensive linemen are going to be watching. And Jimmy is not a great practice player from everything I have heard. He's much better in the games than he is in practice. But the dudes are going to be watching these two quarterbacks throw. And they're going to be watching Trey Lance run around. And they're going to be like, damn it. Why isn't this guy playing? I just think it's such a bad vibe. Like there's a cloud that hangs over it as long as Jimmy is still there. 
Well, I, I would I would say that if they make the right decision, at least in my mind, and play Trey Lance and Jimmy's there is like a highly paid backup, which at this point in the way his contracts age, it's not the worst price to have on your roster along with a guy who's on a rookie contract here. I, he's a guy who, I, in my mind, at the very least, is used to that role. And he doesn't seem like, again, based on the way he's acted through all this, there doesn't seem to be the kind of ego there that's going to be disruptive in this spot. Like, Damn. he's a guy that might have that realization that a lot of quarterbacks do. Hey, I wasn't good enough to be a – or I'm not going to be good enough to be a full-time starter going football going forward. But I can play football for a long time in this league. I can be someone's quality backup here and cash a lot of really nice checks for the next decade if I play my cards right and make sure that I don't alienate people with the way I act. And based on what we saw in the spring through OTAs and heard from him, it seems like that could be more of the trajectory. A $26 million backup is a pretty sweet gig if you can get it. Yeah, I mean, that part won't last for much longer. Like, this will be his last time as that a backup of that caliber here. But, man, I mean, you based on where you've seen some of these guys, like Tyrod Taylor's made a nice gig being the guy before the guy in a bunch of places. So it, it seems like a good spot to get. Again, I, I've always had a great deal of respect for backup quarterbacks. They have a special place in my heart, so there's no shame in joining those ranks. Well, Mike, I really appreciate the time. Uh, I appreciate you instructing me and removing my ignorance when it comes to offensive line play. I appreciate that. Uh, you can catch Golick weekdays 4 to 7 with Chanae and Golick on ESPN Radio. He's on Twitter, at Mike Golick Jr. Thanks a bunch, man. I really appreciate it. Good to see you, Stats, man. Glad everything's going well.